Michael Schliemann was running out of time. The time had come for him to leave. The following day he would go to Cairo to meet Marilyn to conclude his affairs. After that he would go to the snow country, to the mountains in North Japan. And there, alone, under the light of the Aurora Borealis, he would complete his unreliable memoirs, which he might call the dissonant memoirs of a disinformation agent. And then he would disappear. He'd sent his favorite student, Marilyn, ahead of him with his encrypted computer. But his ex-controller at MI6, Maxa, had persuaded him to accept a final assignment. A problem with French intelligence. Schliemann accepted the project because he'd read some of the secret files slipped to him by Maxa. He'd read Lenoir's manifesto and knew it made complete sense. He decided he'd like to meet her. There were too many coincidences in her story and his own. Good evening, Miss Lenoir. Thank you for coming to see us again. Miss Bishop. If he could warn Lenoir, it would be an ideal revenge for him against MI6, many of whom he considered as more fanatical than the terrorists they were trying to expose. He was anyway seriously ill, three months to live at best. Before he died, he was determined to expose details of secret assassinations he had been involved in. But MI6 had arrested Marilyn in Cairo with his computer. Schliemann knew nothing of this, or that Maxo was trying to unravel the webs of his conspiracy of texts. MI6 were worried how much damage could they do? Maxo was unaware that Schliemann had decided to go underground in Vienna to find Lenoir and warn her that French and British intelligence had penetrated her emails and were closing in on her and quite prepared to kill her before more agents were shot. The French had been secretly tailing Schliemann, filmed by their local agent Hermann Vogelstein and his accomplice, a girl marksman who would execute the murder. Their plan was to wait until they were sure Schliemann had found Lenoir and kill them both. Best, their story, died with them. Lenoir's exposure in Paris of their disinformation tactics, working in hand in hand with the media and wealthy corrupt politicians to terrorize the people, had caused them much bitterness. Operation Mount Olive, they called it. Crucify Schliemann when they found him and Lenoir together at the first opportunity.
It was a routine experiment. Monsanto modified wheat planted in Mexico for testing that can only grow with its AIG gene insecticide. Considered to be statistically a virtual impossibility, though there is always a small margin of unpredictability and possible human error, we could not have foreseen the invasion of windborne retroviruses on freak spring El Nino generated monsoons, viruses incubated in the nasal passages of genetically modified cotton bowl weevils, the cotton plants fertilized by ground up British, almost certainly BSE free, meat protein, banned by the rest of the world for all animal consumption, but, mixed with genetically modified molasses and discarded genetically modified soy leaf and molasses discovered to be an ideal plant nutrient in Colombia, especially cocoa plants and illegally sold to Mexico only as an easy cover for money laundering, a windborne retrovirus that destroys any animal immune system in three days, impossible said the Bush administration experts. It defies reason. Either that or a religious cult associated with the Russian Mafia, experimenting with Picarna virus, genetically modified to affect humans, except those incubating the gene. Sleeman was running out of time, and he knew it. He was still not sure which of the Rainbow Warrior girls was Maria Lamar. A realization of the great epidemic, born in and on the wind, the wind in the pines, the winds of change, Maria's dream. It was just before midnight. Michael Schliemann was on the Ringstrasse tram. Number two. He had a strange premonition. That this was to be his final trip round and round, round and round the Ringstrasse. Schliemann took his camera with him at all times. There had been a number of occasions when he was pretty sure that he was being filmed by a young girl. And so he filmed her back. Another occasion in a cafe. And so it went on. He wanted evidence as much as they wanted evidence. He would show them fear in a handful of dots. He would show them fear on a screen with a handful of dots. He'd sent all the film he'd been making to Marilyn in Cairo. He wasn't sure why, but she said she perhaps would make a film out of it. He knew that he was near the end of his journey. There were times when he felt that the body of the tram was his own body, speaking to him, welcome to the machine, speaking to him, welcome to the machine, speaking to him, welcome to the machine. He'd spent the early part of the day listening to music, listening to one of his favorite records, Echoes, by Pink Floyd, listening to a song that had always been one of his favorites, Albatross, by Peter Green. Another song that somehow had always haunted him, Song of the Siren by Tim Buckley. Not good signs at all. But Michael Schliemann was running out of time. He knew that if he couldn't decide which of the girls, which of the Rainbow Warriors, was Maria Lenoir herself. He would not be able to prevent her, to stop her, from attempting the assassination of Nightingale.
He was certain by now that he was being followed. There had been too many coincidences. The only way he could find out now was to expose himself, take the risk of exposing himself, in which case Maria Lenoir would probably kill him. The girl on the tram may have shot Schliemann. Or filmed him after he was murdered. Or both. Vogelstein found Schliemann's body just before dawn. One neat hole in his chest. The MI6 coroner later said he had died of a heart attack. Schliemann had known that Vogelstein was a close friend of one of the girls he was filming. Vogelstein was something of an artist himself. Being an artist in his circles was a way of life. Schliemann had gone to Vienna to finish his memoirs get them posted on the internet and finish his latest pulp spy novel A Night in Vienna and die <laughs> So he put some music so and said do something I was, I was painted like two hours from my old man He was kind of a sister and uh... but not before he had revenged to the death of Maria Lenoir. When you have only three months to live, anyway, you can murder with impunity. Maria's mother was Nora, Nora Flood. She had been an anarchist in Paris in 1968. It was she who had thrown the petrol bomb through the window of the TWA offices in Place de l'Opéra, triggering the May Revolution. She'd had an exhibition of photographs of the splintered windows, a fatal mistake. She was forced to flee. She fled to Cairo, where she became active in an eco-anarchist group. Maria's father was probably Hermann Nachtigall, French intelligence agent sent to find her. But it may have been Michael Schliemann. Later, it was Nachtigall who arranged for Nora to disappear. So much was known by Michael. Not much use to Michael now that the blood was erasing his mind and memory. One of Michael Schliemann's bevy of actresses, a dancer, disappeared on the night of his murder. MI6 and French intelligence separated by their profound mistrust and mutual interest in the Nightingale story, decided not to reveal the truth to each other or to themselves. Images of snow and a white bird A white bird circling, circling above him over a 
silent blue sea. A few days after his death, Schliemann's memoirs appeared on the internet, exposing, amongst many other things, the recent assassination of Maria Lenoir, blown up on a boat with a man she had recently met. But the Rainbow Warrior Girls had a plan to murder Nightingale. Blown up at a musical event, probably in Vienna. The group planned to make a film of this spectacle the spectacular murder of Nightingale. But there was other news. The agents sent to Cairo arrested Schliemann's student, Marilyn, and she was sent back to London. Data suggested she might be a Russian agent working for their anti-terrorist wing. Both girls had the same name. This Marilyn was clearly studying illegally in the United Kingdom. She had very good references, it seemed, from Michael Schliemann. But they had decided that this girl was Maria Lenoir. They raided her rooms in Cambridge and found an unfinished novel she was writing called The Memoirs of Maria Lenoir. They also found a copy of a novel by Nora Flood called Nora and heavily underlined in red ink. She had a CD of songs, punk rock songs, sung by who killed Bambi? A love letter from Michael Schliemann to Maria. Who is Matthew Sutherland? Is he not related to your Shiva? Your friend? Well, you seem to know everything. Why are you asking me? Why? What makes you think it's everything? Everything about what? About the murder of the two agents, as you say. <sighs> you know, I always try to respect authority. It's part of my split nature. As I respect and love Intelligent authors who use words to imagine other worlds, not rape this one as you seem to be hell-bent on doing. Especially the authors of some serious pulp fiction novels that study the point at which innocent people become criminals, quite despite themselves, victims of the state. And this love of mine, of these books, it's a second nature to me. I don't suppose you would ever comprehend what the word nature means, would you? Do you know that my nickname is Nature's Child? Are you, have you heard of that? Given to me by the old Nick, perhaps? Thank you very much. Okay, ciao. A proposal for a PhD in creative writing. It is utterly brilliant, her new tutor insisted, and quite genuine. you 
find such a ridiculous plot. You're worse than frustrated novelists. You're just ludicrous. Meanwhile, in Vienna, Vogelstein had arrested one of the girls, an opera singer, and found a laptop computer there, obviously belonging to Michael Schliemann. With their little persuasion, they found the code word. In London, Maxa had the laptop that had come from Cairo with Marilyn. She soon realized that they were almost identical, but only almost identical. That all the texts were just slightly different. And she soon realized that the meaning the, the only way to decode Schliemann's obviously corrupted texts was to realize all the subtle differences between the one and the other. This observation was later to earn her an MBE. One laptop was numbered number two. The other laptop was numbered number one. When she finally went to the website hidden on the net, she found that that too was a different variation. What are you looking for? Are you looking for continuity or a narrative in me? Just because I had an affair with my tutor? I got drunk, that's all. I don't recollect anything at all. Is this the way to run the interrogation service? To interrogate a poor student just beho because she happens to be working on a thesis on the origins of anarchism and Trotsky and Fanon. Are you mad? Or just frustrated novelists? Hello? Maria? Hello? Shit. On the laptops were two texts, a chapter from a novel called Nora and set in Paris during May 1968 and during the revolution, and the other in Cairo. In one chapter, the daughter of Nora, called Maria, had a father called Herr Nachtingal, a French intelligent. In the other, the father of her child, Maria, was an agent in British intelligence, Michael Schliemann, otherwise known as Matthew Sutherland. In Maria Lenoir's memoirs, it was made perfectly clear that Herr Nachtingal, head of French intelligence in Cairo, later became the director of a number of projects for French intelligence in Paris. The most important one being the assignment of five agents to New Zealand to sink the Rainbow Warrior boat the Greenpeace boat, in which Fernando Pereira was drowned. Well, I, I found one here. Yeah, it, it's been left to go wild and it's interwoven with... French and British like, intelligence like agreed to make all references to any of Michael Schliemann's story 
other than the so-called fictions or the fictions that were so-called reality or whatever. Any reference to Schliemann's story, facts, coincidences, probably. Any reference would be to imply that they were accomplices in terrorism. What? The speech again. Okay. Why do you think Goddard killed off his women characters always in his early films? Because and in his latest films. They just look best dead. But in his first, in that Abu Dussoufra, it's the male character who was killed. And then there's that famous scene where she says, Say quoi, de Golas. Say that again, what? Every black haired woman I see, I always think it's Anna. Anna Schmidt? Mm -hmm. In the novel Nora Anne, Nora is in love with a girl called Anna, who's German. Oh, I'm in love with many Annas. There's many different Polish, Russian, Anna Karina, Danish. Is she from Denmark? Yeah. You should know. French. Anna Schmidt, she's from Czechoslovakia. Mostly Slavic, I guess. My name should have been Anna. Why? Well, because my parents couldn't decide between Anna or Sophie. Or maybe it was my brother whose name should have been Anna. But one of us should have been called Anna, but then they liked my name better. A brother with the name Anna would have been a bit difficult. Well, that was before they knew he was going to be a boy. <laughs> my name should have been Max if I had been a boy. Maximilian? Yes, like all the emperors here. She's such an icon here that in a way it's almost like so logical that you're filming that. No, I can't. <laughs> well, why is it log <laughs> logical or illogical? Many, uh, many people <laughs> film her. <laughs> really? Because they're always like, oh my god. We have no idea why. Yeah, no, but normally, it, no, a lot of people film it. A loss of symmetry in his brain, between left and right, past and future. A dissonance in which words were sounds without meaning. And what had once been music was now verging on white noise. Julius But Michael Schliemann was running out of time. He closed his eyes and he could see himself lying dead in the tram, empty of people. He had put out his hand and touched her. And as if she was made of fragile glass, she crumbled in his hand, cut his veins, and he watched the blood flow and his life flowing away. Until he realized it was not his own wrists that had been cut, but both their wrists. Finally, he had become one with himself. One with his fate, one with his brief moment of time, one with the heap of broken images that he would leave behind, one with the montage in his mind of journeys, finished and unfinished, speeding up, speeding up, 
closer and closer. Le goût de l'infini, closer and closer to oblivion. And then he remembered the last text he'd been writing, his last novel, The Girl on the Train, which he'd set in the snow country in Japan. Someone else was reading it to him, almost as if he had written it, not so much for others, but for himself. It was in his own way, a book of the dead. It might have been better if he'd written the story as an opera. He'd no idea dying was so difficult. Delay, postponement, self-delusion. The opera as a cathedral celebrating the death of others, ideally in each other's arms. Such a subtle form of emotional and psychological terrorism. If he had his time again, Michael realized that he should have made his film into a punk opera, even a post-punk opera. based on Hermann Hesse's Steppenwolf, put on in the Berg Theatre with the punk rock group Who Killed Bambi. He could see it in his mind, in his mind's eye. After the performance, the theater occupied by an eco-terrorist group with Karashnikovs. A short time after Michael had died, he seemed to be still thinking. He could hear the wind also. He was remembering that the day before, he had been filming with Maya at the museum. She'd been talking about opera.
progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. Okay, the last three lines. Go back two more. And, and the mazed world by their increase now knows not which is which. Excellent. If you can do that again. Yes, Chasni. And the mazed world by their increase now knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evils comes from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. But Michael couldn't understand. The film he was watching in his mind was going backwards. Or part of it was going backwards. Half of it. As if half his mind, half his brain was looking forward, half his brain was looking back. And he was falling, falling, falling into the, the split between the two. And the words of Maria telling him about entanglement. Entanglement are two events which appear to be split in time and space. Holographic time and space can become unified in a moment of death, perhaps, sometime soon, he would perhaps understand what Maria meant in her writings about her suicide.